Hey, this is Joe with Joe and Tell, and right now I am speaking with Andrew Jones. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. I work in Burbank, and I see a lot of celebrities. Yes. And I've, I don't think I've ever stopped one of them to say, hey, hey, can I take a photo? <laughs> But if I saw you, I think I might have to say, hey, Andrew Jones, hey. what's up? Can, can I talk to you for a second? How do you feel about that? And, you know, is it just that audio files are kind of weird like that? You know, I think that it's a case of who you admire and for what, right? So if you interact acting or movies, then you'll see a, an actor, a, a movie star who you think is particularly good. And you feel you want to talk to them because you've got something in common and you admire their work. Um, is a movie star better at what they do than a famous physicist is better than what they do or an engineer? It's down to what you're interested in. So I, I think that uh, I get stopped and, oh, I, Andrew Jones, you know, it's, it's a nice feeling. Um, it's nice I need time to be recognised for what you do. Um, you yeah, know, there's always ego with, with things in the sense of, uh, am I doing it only to be liked by other people? No. What I do is because I'm passionate about what I do, um, because it's my personal passion. It has been forever. But it's it's nice when people agree with you and and like what you do. What, what percentage of those people who stop you are male? Well, you'd have to say the percentage of Males is almost 100% in the audio <laughs> industry. So it's it's just because of that. Okay. Just because I looked at my analytics for my channel. Yeah. And I think it was at 99.9% .9 male. Yeah. And we just joked that Angela, my wife, is the 1%. You know, there's a surprising number of uh, women in the audio field. And I know a lot of them. And we all have these discussions all the time because... Uh, people say, oh, there's, women aren't interested in audio. And so you can't, well, Ava Manley runs Manley Labs for amplifiers. You've got uh, Gershman Acoustics. You've got all sorts of people who are in uh, audio that are, are women. And yet most people seem to think there's nobody that it's almost totally male. That's not true, but the proportion obviously is low. However, there's a difference between what I notice uh, in attendance at shows between the US and, let's say, the rest of the world, and particularly Europe. When you go to a show in Europe, so many more families come hmm. along. Um, it's not just that it's women, it's the whole family comes along and takes part in the experience of going around listening to the system. So it's... Uh, women and its kids. And I think that's so much better that... That's cool, yeah. You think of man caves. You know, the guys always have their garage where they're doing cars or they've got their home theatre and it's just their space. Well, why isn't it a family activity for audio? Uh, we all enjoy music, so why can't you make that a family experience? And I think you see it in home theatre setups where a lot of people used to be building home theatre rooms separate from every other room in the house and they've fallen out of popularity a bit because it means somebody disappears into that <laughs> theatre room and comes out two hours later and they haven't interacted with the family um, there's no reason why you can't make good music reproduction part of a family experience and I'd say it's borne out in other parts of the world so I enjoy going to these shows Hmm. because uh, you have different interactions when you're speaking to the family than when you're just speaking to the guy. I know you have a twin brother. Yes. Uh, Owen, right? Owen, yes. Uh, are you identical twins? We are identical twins, and we're what's called mirror twins. Um, in the simplest form, he's left-handed, I'm right-handed. Um, but there's also, with mirror twins, there's uh, something about asymmetry in facial features. So everybody's face is asymmetrical. And in mirror twins, those asymmetries are swapped over. So just as if you look in a mirror compared to looking at a photograph of yourself, 
you never, you look at a photo, that, that's not me, that doesn't look like me. What you see of you every day is what you look like in a mirror, where the image comes straight back at you. In a photograph, it's flipped left to right. So that's why you don't think you look like your photograph. Now, with a mirror twin, his asymmetry is opposite of mine. So if I see a picture of me, I think it's him. And same with voices. Uh, you never hear, if you hear a recording of yourself, that, that doesn't sound like me. Um, you hear yourself differently compared to how others hear you. So if I hear a recording of me, then my impression is it's my brother. So it's good. So if I see somebody who I think is Andrew Jones, maybe I shouldn't just go up right away. It might not be Andrew Jones. It could well be my brother. <laughs> okay, Mr. Jones. And he's actually, he's done a lot uh, from what I've read about uh, with THX. Yeah, so we both got interested in science. We we're, were always geeks and uh, got interested in science and then uh, audio and photography by early teens. So... We ended up very, very interested in hi-fi. So we were buying hi-fi, we were building stuff, and his was always an interest more towards electronics, and mine, for some reason that I've never fathomed, uh, became speakers. So I'd be trying to build speakers, or even I was trying to build test equipment to measure speakers, because even at that early stage, uh, before I went off to university, I kind of got into the thought that, okay, so I could build a speaker. How do I know if it's any good? And to me, to know if it was any good meant, well, I need to be able to measure it. How do I measure it? And so I was building little pieces of test gear to find ways of measuring speakers. Um, so that stayed with me throughout my whole career. Um, but we both ended up deciding this is the kind of career we want to pursue. So I uh, went off to university. My brother studied uh, electronics at one university, and I studied physics with some acoustics at a different university, first time we'd been apart. And then uh, after our degree, we joined together at an audio research lab in his university to pursue postgraduate research. He was uh, researching amplifier topologies, I was researching um, computer-aided crossover network design, you know, implementing new algorithms to do computer-aided design. Um, then I stayed on at that university, kind of a little switch, that uh, I joined a noise cancellation research group. And uh, so I spent about three years doing active noise cancellation. Then he joined me in that group and I eventually left. So he spent the rest of a significant part of his career in noise cancellation. Just like all the headphones you get these days, the noise cancelling headsets. He did a lot of work and has a lot of patents in that field. Um, I went and joined KEF, and so that was my speaker university, let's say. And um, now, so the, it's one of these, these fingers that just, you know, everything crosses and tangles up in the audio world. So the technical director at KEF, who was my mentor, Laurie Fincham, uh, I came with him to the States, uh, joined Infinity. Um, eventually he became um, sort of chief scientist at THX and started to employ my brother on consultancy work to do design work for THX. And uh, he designed some amplifier topology that became the basic building engine of that amplifier. Um, so it's uh, it's all connected. And so he's still doing that amplifier topology. That's a killer combination right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I find that uh, Johnny Ive at Apple, uh -huh. you've heard him before? Yes. Uh, Johnny Ive, when he speaks, it just makes me want to buy whatever he's talking about. And... Uh, Tiff Needell, you familiar with him, mm -hmm. uh, Fifth Gear? Whenever he speaks, it's so authoritative and you just, you know, you can't argue with him. And kind of the same thing with you. Whenever you speak, I kind of just like, my wallet just comes out, <laughs> take my money. You think your accent has uh, anything to do with your success? I, 
I like to think it's my charm, and the accent is part of it. <laughs> now, so I think being over here, people are always commenting on accent, right? And I, I think there is this generic idea that anything said in a British accent sounds better. Um, on the other hand, when I first came over here, uh, I loved the southern accent, you know, that southern draw, draw and mm. twang. I think people are attracted to the ideas of different accents. Um, I still have my accent after 24 years of being here. It's not a deliberate attempt to keep it. It's just, I think once you've got an accent, it's very difficult to think that it's going to just go away. It might moderate a, a little when you're in a different country and surrounded by, um, let's say, typically non-British accents. But still, I talk to my brother nearly every day, so that uh. keeps the accent <laughs> fresh. He's still back in England. Um, it certainly it distinguishes you a little, having that accent. So um, I would say it definitely helps. <laughs> what are some technologies that are not speaker-related? Are you kind of fascinated by right now? I don't know if it's technologies as such, as, as opposed to, let's say, avenues of research, right? So, for example, I have a, a nephew who just spent uh, a 10-week internship at JPL, and he's working on coding for the Mars Rover 2020. Now, that is cool. Uh, the... I know I was always fascinated with space travel when I was a kid. Yeah, I was a geek. That's one of the things that you're always going to be fascinated with. And um, your know, ideas of being an astronaut, which that was never going to happen. But uh, the idea of space exploration and life on other planets, that fascinates me. So the technology involved with being able to launch rockets, go to the moon, go to Mars, the idea that you can something so far away you can both build a rocket to get there build a space vehicle that you can land control and drive around on the surface of mars and now i've got a nephew who's working on that and knowing that in 2020 when it lands and you see it running around you think my nephew had something to do with that that's so a small cool. part but that is just mind-blowing. That's so cool. Yeah, we can control all these things on Mars, but sometimes my Wi-Fi still goes out. In my... <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what, are, uh, what are some technologies that are speaker-related that you're fascinated by? So let's say I built my career on doing moving coil loudspeakers, right? The alternative technology, the only real practical alternatives to a regular moving coil speaker is either a magna planar type speaker mm. uh, or electrostatic. Now, I've had a lifelong fascination also with electrostatic speakers. And so I was uh, uh, good friends with Peter Walker who founded uh, Quad, the electrostatic speaker company. And I nearly went to work for him. Um, so those technologies, I've always had a love for. I've got all sorts of variants of electrostatic speakers in my collection. Mm. And uh, I've always wondered about building something based on electrostatic technology. But it is so different, it's so limited in what it can do, but extraordinarily good at some other things that uh, it's not a, such a career path for me. But it is, I still have a hobbyist interest beyond doing uh, this as a job. But it's the best job in the world for me because it's what I've always been interested in. I still, beyond that, beyond what would I do uh, for any company that I'm working for, for designs that I'm going to be selling, what am I interested in outside of that? I have... Uh, I do have hobbies other than just speakers, well, so I'm not quite that boring. But it's still, I still have that hobbyist side of it, that hobbyist it. interest. And so, so 
that's not necessarily a hint as to what's a comfort. For, oh no, that's that's, no. that's hobbyist Andrew Jones. Yes. Got yes. it. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> so I have some questions from Reddit. I posted mm -hmm. on audiophile and budget audiophile that I'm going to be interviewing Mr. Andrew Jones, and if anybody had questions, to post oh, it yeah. there. Yeah. So this one is from, hopefully I'm saying this right, Umlotica. And the question is, what measurements do you find most often correlate with listener preference? Interesting expressed as listener preference, right? So I've had a lot of debates online uh, about accuracy, right? So first of all, like I said, when I was growing up, getting interested in audio, I was saying that, you know, it occurred to me, shouldn't I be measuring a speaker in order to know what it's doing? Because how can I just trust my ears? Now, trusting your ears, if I'm a teenager, what do I know about what sounds good? So you could question, if the goal of hi-fi is accuracy, then how do I know something's accurate? On the other hand, if the, if the goal is just what do I like my music to sound like? Then accuracy doesn't matter there. It's what do I like? Um, in which case you're free to choose or design however you want. But hi-fi is supposed to be about supposed to be about the closest approach to the original sound. So if we use that as a starting point, the closest approach to the original sound, then presumably every part of the system should be accurate. And we would at least say accuracy represents uh, a flat frequency response. It must not modify the spectrum of the signal passing through it. Now, we can very easily uh, achieve that in electronics. CD player, amplifier, for example. We can get a flat frequency response over as wide a bandwidth as we care to. With a speaker or a microphone, um, but especially with a speaker, much, much more difficult. It's difficult just to get a flat response because when we're talking about flat response, we've got on a macro and a micro level. Macro means the general trend in the response. Is it tilted slightly upwards, tilted downwards as we go to higher frequencies? Is it bumped up in the mid-range? Then you've got the micro part of that. Within that general trend, is it wiggly? Is it smooth? Is there decay in there? So there's a lot of things that we can measure that will give us some idea of how flat the frequency response is if we decide that the goal is a flat frequency response. Problem with a loudspeaker is that uh, that frequency response is very difficult to measure because to measure a speaker, you have to measure it in an environment. And the environment influences the measurement. So a second factor is that the particular direction in which we make that measurement from the loudspeaker matters because a loudspeaker does not give the same response in all directions. It's even arguable whether it should do. You know, is the perfect loudspeaker a omnidirectional source? So flat response at all angles. Arguably, no. Um, arguably better is uh, a flat response, but at different levels in different directions, i.e. controlled directivity, so that you minimize some interaction once you put it into a room. An omnidirectional involves all of the room. A directional speaker minimizes the contribution of the room and you hear more of just what the speaker is doing. So we've got this very complex thing of what do we mean by frequency response? So we could say that uh, the objective goal of an accurate speaker is flat frequency response. Um, but we have to define over what directions and we have to achieve that over what directions and we have to make sure it's not just in the general trend, but in the micro detail. So, yes, a goal would be a, a flat response if you want accuracy. Uh, 
if that's all that determined accuracy, great. But it isn't when we're listening to music because, and I've argued this so many times, the closest approach to the original sound, what original sound? An orchestra or a string quartet? That can exist in front of you and you can go and listen to it in an acoustic setting and go, oh, that's what the real sound of those instruments are. How do you capture that to play back? You're listening with your ears and your brain in that space. When you listen at home, you're listening over two speakers. You can never get the same impression over just two speakers that you got in the original event that you were live at. Then you've got the case, well, what do the microphones measure like? What do they sound like? Um, do you use the same microphone for every instrument? Where do you capture the sound from that instrument? You capture it at a distance or do you get in close? Um, what do you do in the mixing and the mastering? Uh, there are some recordings where people take a pair of BNK calibrated measuring microphones and make, just set them up, make a recording, no processing to play back over two speakers. But that is not accurate reproduction because the ear is not processing the sound over two speakers that it would have processed in the original event. So I sort of gave up on the idea of that closest approach to the original sound. So if you can't have that, what do I de design to? Yeah, because let's even say I'm going to design my speaker to have a flat response. Is it going to have a flat response? No. Does any speaker have a perfectly flat response? No. Not a speaker in the world has a perfectly flat response, and certainly not even close to the flatness level that an amplifier would have. So uh, you might expect that the more expensive the speaker is, the closer you can get to a nice flat response. Let's suppose that's true. Uh, as you come down in price, it's never going to be perfectly flat. So if it's not perfectly flat, it's going to have some things response character. Which one? Which one matters? How do I... I've got to listen to say, well, I can't get it perfectly flat, so I don't, do I want it flat in this region and I'll compromise in some other regions? Because every speaker design is a compromise. Which compromise do I make when I'm designing? And how do I know which compromise to choose? Don't I have to listen to it? What do I listen to? What music? Because how was that music recorded? We know absolutely that music or 99% of music is not recorded accurately. Some of it doesn't even exist outside the sphere of being generated in a console. Uh electronic keyboards, synthesized sound, has no reality for me to say, yeah, that sounds more like what that mm -hmm. synthesizer should sound like. You only ever hear it through listening through speakers in some room, and that would be the control room. So maybe the only system we ever need is the speakers that they use to mix the sound on. Everything else is a step away from accuracy. But then we get into the problem, well, different studios sound different. Different recording engineers use different speakers to mix and master on. So now where are we? <laughs> it's, it's one of these questions that isn't really an answer. So when I'm designing a speaker, certainly from a measurement point of view, uh, through experience and through research I've read, I still think the goal ultimately is tr to strive towards a flat response over a given range of angles. And if I choose a particular axis to make flat, try and make sure that as I move away from that optimum angle, 
uh, it's still very well behaved. And sometimes I will compromise the flatness on axis to get better flatness off axis or in a range of off axis angles, because that generally gives a better result than only flat on mm. axis and wrong everywhere else. So, but it's still, it's going to, from my measurements, I'm going to strive towards that, but I'm still going to have to listen and decide in the areas where it's not flat, which preferences do I go for? And it's going to be down to me. Every speaker I design, the sound that you get from that was me making a personal preference as to what it was going to sound like because it's flawed and it's down to me balancing those flaws. And I have a range of recordings that I listen to over and over again that I feel... It's not that I know this is what that recording was supposed to sound like. It's, I've heard this recording on lots of different systems, in lots of different rooms, and I've got an idea in my head of, in general, to me, this is how I feel that recording right. should sound and gives me the best results in these different situations, and therefore I fiddle till I get a sound so, that I want. What's one of those tracks? So, so Andrew Jones doesn't just listen to uh, Sweep Test. <laughs> no. Okay. What's one of those tracks? Just one. So, one very... Uh, well, it's a Diana Crawl track. Now, I know in the hi-fi <laughs> world, people don't want to ever listen to Diana Crawl again. It's like going to a show and someone's playing Hotel California by the Eagles, right? Nothing, nothing to do with judgment of the music. Simply familiarity of, on this particular track, familiarity, and certain aspects of that recording that allow me to easily tell that this range in the speaker is correct, or correct as I view it. Uh, very quick, I can put it on. I'm so familiar, I go, yeah. I need to fix this area in the speaker. Um, I don't use it at hi-fi shows. Um, you played Dead Mouse that one time, I've, I heard. Yeah, I, I try and... <laughs> I, I'm not an arbiter of taste for music. I, I have my ideas of what to play. I have also tracks that I find popular with people that are not always what everyone else is playing. That's part of the goal when you're doing a show. Find music that highlights the system, um, is musically interesting, not just to me, but to most of the people who come in. So that's why when I'm at a show, I'm the one stood up there, picking the music, talking to people, playing. I want to see the reaction. Right. I want to see the reaction both to the sound quality I'm presenting to people. But I also want to understand, do they like that? Do they like my choice of music? I want them to have an experience when they come in. like that. And I think it reflects in your speaker design also. I think it shows that you know what you like, what your preferences are, but you're also considerate of where, how other people are going to use that speaker. Well, that's it. Uh, so let's take hobbyist versus let's say professional, right? As a, profe as a professional, you need to be commercially successful. So you need speakers that sound uh, such that people will want to buy them. Now, therefore, am I deliberately designing something that I think will attract people? No. But I've been very lucky that the sound that I'm looking to get has been commercially successful, right? And sometimes you'll listen to some equipment and go, what were they thinking, right? Someone liked that, <laughs> but not enough people to make it commercially successful. So I, I, it sounds elitist to say I'm, you know, what I like, everyone seems to like. It's just that's the way it's turned out. It's, but it's definitely not I'm trying to commercialise the sound that, I want. 
We can get back to that in, in the next question, yeah. actually. I have a few rapid-fire questions. Um, so I'm going to name some famous sound signatures, and I just want to get kind of your opinion on each one. That was from work on the RS35A. That was their most famous um, mobile monitor. And the BBC dip arose. Remember I said I will sometime, sometimes compromise on-axis performance in order to get better off-axis performance. So clearly when you listen to a speaker in a room, you hear some of the direct sound, let's say the on-axis sound, and then you hear reflections. The reflections are from the off-axis sound. The ear does some kind of complex processing to balance between the direct and the reflected sounds to get an overall impression of the sound of that speaker in that room. Now, very often the direct on-axis sound, it's the point of maximum symmetry when you look at a speaker like this, right? You're equidistant mm. from the side, you're equidistant in the center of the frame of the speaker. Um, if it's gonna have any diffraction wiggles in the response, it's gonna be exactly on-axis. Those all smooth as you go off-axis. So very often, move a few degrees off-axis, you get better um, frequency response. So don't necessarily flatten the on-axis, but flatten around 10 degrees off, let's say. So what happens with things like the BBC dip in that frequency range? It's a range where certainly if it's too high in level, it adds a hardness to the sound, not attractive. Um, but it's also because uh, a lot of speaker designs in those days, being a simple two-way speaker with a crossover point, three, three and a half K, the tweeters weren't good enough to come down below a three K crossover. So crossovers were typically three to three and a half to four K. Um, the directivity of the tweeter was so very different at the crossover point than the woofer that if you balance it flat on axis, it would never be flat off axis. And it would leave off axis that um, area um, higher. So the, the off axis response, instead of smoothly falling off, would dip and then bump up in that three to four to five K region before rolling off. So since particularly the LS35A was developed for small mobile control rooms, where you've got a lot of reflected sound. So dipping it out there helped in the overall tonality of the speaker. So I think that BBC dip arose from the difficulty of balancing on and off axis sound due to limitations in technology in those days. Now, take a concentric driver, don't do that. I'd never put a deliberate dip in. Bowers and Wilkins, I've heard a few of their speakers and I noticed that they kind of pull this disappearing act where I, it sounds like the speakers aren't there. And from what I've read, some people have said that there's a slight dip in the five kilohertz uh, region to give that transparency. I doubt whether it's a, a dip in that region uh, in that sense. It, there's, I mean, you see, there's so many different BMW speakers. So you know, which one are you going to use as an example of this? Uh, one, one common characteristic of uh, most BMW speakers these days is they've got this tweeter on top as a separate pod. Now, uh, you could argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in terms of does it match the directivity of the mid-range unit. But nonetheless, they typically, by doing that, they've removed some of the diffraction effects. Whenever you smooth the diffraction effects, the speaker is more likely to disappear because those re-radiated signals from the edge of the cabinet give the impression that you're li you've got a, an object in front of you. The wavefront mm. isn't expanding as clearly. Um, doing a concentric driver, you're trying to do the same kind of things. It's not only optimizing and matching off-axis response to on-axis, but it's also minimizing some of those effects of the edges of the cabinet. And so whenever you can do that, um, or you take the LS50, for example. Um, not only is it a concentric driver and a superbly engineered concentric driver, it's also got a baffle that curves back on itself, which is always better than a flat 
baffle, even a flat baffle with rounded edges is not as good as a baffle that just curves back on itself. How about Harbeth's approach to vocals first? I would say it's not only Harbeth. There are certain people who, uh, if vocals are wrong, nothing is right. Uh, and so there's a number of different kind of speakers on the market that are, let's say, limited bandwidth. It's particularly these single unit full range speakers that you get. Uh, very popular in Japan, for example. And uh, they concentrate on vocals because the idea is that in music, maybe the vocalist is the most important that communicates the feel of the song. And so uh, also we as human beings are evolved to listen to voices. Um, we hear voices all the time. <laughs> reason I might say, well, I hear voices all the time. <laughs> that, I'm taking medication for that. Uh, but the idea is, therefore, vocal reproduction done right is critical to the experience of listening to music. And so, like I was saying, everything is a compromise. So what are you going to um, concentrate on? So for some people, got to get the vocals right and they don't care about anything else. Or they care, but not as much. And so if, if um, Harbeth is saying we take care of vocals, then fine, that's their decision. I also think that with the technologies I'm using, uh, concentric drivers, the way they project the vocal into the sound stage uh, is very different from um, what a lot of speakers are able to do. So I also listen to vocals, but it's not the only thing that I've got it. So how would you describe the Andrew Jones sound signature? <sighs> well, one thing I don't do is a lot of listening to the competition. On some product ranges, I will get some competitive speakers just to look at construction, um, to see you know, where compromises are made or uh, fit and finish, just to get a general idea. But I almost never listen to them. I will measure them because I want to establish are the specifications accurate? Because we get questions like with the, the Unify speakers, their forum speakers. People are going, will, will it match my amplifier? And we have to explain about speaker impedance and it's not constant level and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but also, and sensitivity. Is it an 85 dB sensitivity? Is it 89? Is it as some people claim their speakers are 94? And then you look, and you look at you look at the physics of it, and going, the physics of saying how sensitive a speaker can be are very easily understood and defined. It cannot be ninety four dB in that size box with that bass extension and that impedance. So, what I try to do is be honest in the specs, both in sensitivity and impedance, because there are, and bass extension because. It's a juggling act between those three parameters. And you can't cheat on that with the physics. You can cheat with the marketing, let's say. But I need to know if someone's claiming it's four ohms, you've got a competitive advantage if you cheat on impedance because the speaker will sound louder, but it's actually taking more power and might cause problems with your amplifier. So if I'm gonna be honest with my specs, I look to be poorer on specifications. And this is a problem because you wouldn't believe the number of people who pour over all your specifications that you quote and go, well, your center channel goes down one hertz lower than this <laughs> speaker. <sighs> okay, yay, right? Uh, not really important. Um, but Sensitivity and impedance matter. And so I need to at least know, am I on a level playing field with what other people are saying about the performance specs of their speakers? So that's about the only thing I do. Um, but in terms of listening to them, it's back to this idea, I, I know what kind of sound I want to achieve. 
I know that other manufacturers have their own sound signatures. That's fine. You've got a following. I've got a following. Right. I'm not going to try and steal your customers by giving them your sound but out of my speaker. That's not my objective. I'm just going to give you what I think is uh, my honest presentation of what I want to give you and get customers from them. As far as the, the sound signature, uh, you know, I, I don't, of course, I don't expect you to give away all your secrets, but uh, like some things that I've noticed. So I have the pioneers that, that you've made. I have, uh, I've recommended the B6s, the debut B6s to friends. So I've heard those. I own the Unify uh, UB5s and the UC5. And I have noticed compared to some of the other speakers that I have that maybe the treble is a little bit rolled off. And that's one of the questions that people were having. Um, you know, why, why is the treble so rolled off? I mean, for me personally, I feel like I kind of like that. I feel like I, I like to be able to turn it up. It's not fatiguing when I do turn it up. So that's me personally, but you know, coming from the source. So some of the speakers, especially off axis were a bit, uh, maybe a little low, you know, the original debut and they were reasonably flat on axis, but I made a more directional waveguide on them. And so as you go off axis, it starts to drop. And I certainly, in terms of tonality that I was wanting to get out of that and making it an enjoyable to listen speaker, I certainly erred on the treble being, uh, let's say on the side, flat to low rather than flat to high. I don't like aggressive treble. And I also recognize that when you, the likely partnering equipment, the likely quality of the music that's being played, i.e. not audiophile type things, um, they can sound even worse if you've got aggressive treble. Now, again, there are speakers on the market that are always more aggressive treble, and some people like that. That's fine. It's not what I was looking for. So. I accept that it was more of a rolled off sound, except some people like it. And this is always the thing. This is the danger of trying to follow a trend or outguess what someone wants compared to just going with what I feel I want to do. You'll say some, you'll read all the reviews or read uh, comments from people who purchase speakers. And some will go, it's a bit rolled off. Some will go, it's a bit aggressive. Really? But, okay. <laughs> so, if you've got opinions both ways, yeah. then it's kind of, on average, it's about right. right. Um, nonetheless, I do accept, certainly with the original debut, that it was uh, slightly rolled off, but it gave it a nice, easy listening. That was one of my compromises for the class and price of the speaker. In redoing it, uh, I looked at it again, and one of the issues there, it's not just, let's say, is it flat response on axis? It's, like I was saying, what does it also do off axis? Now, it was a bit more directional. And you're talking about the, the debut? The, the debut, the, the original debut first. Okay. So, as you go off axis, the treble was, due to the waveguide, a bit directional, so it dropped off. It's, it's okay, except uh, as audiophiles, we get into the habit of you set up speakers on stands, away from the walls, you tow them in towards the listening location. Fine. On a $200-ish speaker, or even with the Pioneers at $130, people are not doing that. <laughs> they're putting it on a credenza, they're backing it up against the wall, and they're facing it straight down, right? So you're always off axis where the treble is more rolled off. So always one of the quick answers was tow them in. Yeah, but I don't want to, okay. So in debut two, I've made sure that I've widened the dispersion character. So it doesn't drop off quite as much off axis uh, compared to on axis as the original version did. So um, it's not as critical for, orienting the speaker. So they sound not, 
this is semantics. They're not bright. They're brighter. They're just a little more open in the top end because I've elevated the treble just a little bit, but not to the extent of making it bright and brittle. Just, it sounds more open. And and you also put the the bass port in the front. Yes. So not only are you a speaker designer, but you also understand uh, a little bit about... Practical. Well, <laughs> that's that's kind of cool. Once you have a helpline set up and people start calling in going, the vent's at the back. How close can I put it to the wall? Oh, not that question again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. I, I capitulate. I'm putting it to the front. <laughs> this, is a, this is a question from Travis per Peregrine. Peregrine. Yes. Peregrine. Peregrine. Sound Travis Peregrine. Yes. Sound the soft British. <laughs> okay. Um, should I listen to music with my speaker grills on or off? And so I'm assuming this is with uh, the ELAC speakers. I have two kids, so grills on for me. So, uh, as a speaker designer, we always say grills off, right? It's very difficult to design a truly transparent grill that has no effect. Um, or combining it with something that looks nice with it on. Uh, a grill that looks nice and has no acoustic detriment, very difficult. So you always go to yourself as a speaker designer, oh, grills, what am I gonna do this time? So the answer is, I pretty much always design for grill off. Okay. That's the purity, right? Because it's not as if a grill is doing something simple in terms of sound balance. If you have cloth, let's say you had cloth with no frame, cloth will give a very slight attenuation towards the treble. And depending on which cloth you use, it might be just a half dB gradual loss by the treble frequencies, or it might be a dB. If you if you get really bad cloth, it can be a dB and a half. Mm -hmm. That you should reject, <laughs> um, except it is a tone control. But it's a very smooth, gentle character. But everything else about the grill, all the support structure, if it's a wood piece, with that's the worst. If it's molded and you've got lots of open areas, that's not so bad. But it causes diffraction and wiggles, and you can't compensate for that. So the answer is it's always better off. There are very rare circumstances where speakers have been designed that they're right with the grill on because of the particular way they've designed it, but then it will be wrong with the grill off. So simple answer, always take the grills off. Grills are for protection and to make it look nice, but they're not to make it that's so better. crazy. That's so crazy that it makes a difference with the grill. I mean, I've heard you talk about how the screws made a difference. Yes. And yeah. That's that's amazing. Right. Now, how about I've seen people actually take off the the metal grill on the tweeters. I yes. like them. I mean, that's uh, a well, protection for me. It is protection, and the important thing with speakers at this price point, either both in the stores but at home, especially protect the tweeter. You don't want people poking things in. So there's grills. Now, will that mesh grill make a small change? Yes. It'll also reveal a slot, a circular slot, where the grill went in, which screws up the sound, produces a dip in the response. So it swings and round rounds. You, you change one character, but you definitely make another part of it worse. Some people even were taking off the whole trim ring <laughs> yes. around it, right? Yes. Now, I don't mind. If that sounds better to you, and you've paid your money, fine. You've voided the warranty, but that's that's your problem. Um, if you want to play things, doing things like that, that's okay. I think the question is, did Andrew Jones design it with the trim ring on and the the metal on there? Yes. Okay. Andrew Jones, it seems like you enjoy what you do, <laughs> and you're kind of living the dream. Yeah. You make you play with speakers, and you get paid for it. What would you say to the younger generation? who maybe doesn't understand that you can do something that you enjoy and it's possible to make money doing it and make a whole career out of it? What would be your advice to them? So it depends which... Uh, pure hi-fi, audiophile, has been declining for a long time. It's, it's maybe stable in terms of what it used to be. There used to be a period where audiophile was very specialized. Then in the 70s and 80s, it 
exploded. Now it's going back to a more natural level. If you look at regular box speakers, that's a declining market, 5% a year or something. So um, we're growing, but we're doing that by stealing market share, let's say. Um, the category that is growing, soundbars are still growing, headphones, of course, and um, Bluetooth slash powered speakers. Now, the category that's growing is you know, $100 type things. Uh, you take something like the, the LS15W, um, all in one package. They've established a market for that. I don't know how big it is, but it certainly generated interest. We're doing our uh, Argo Navis speaker um, because as an engineering approach, this is the way an engineer would design a speaker, put it all together. Um, that might be... F I th hoping that that becomes the future more for Audiophile because the new listener isn't growing up thinking I want a collection of boxes. They just want sound and they want convenience. So that's what's driven the market for Bluetooth. You walk into the house, it's already, the music's already playing on your phone. It immediately transfers over Bluetooth to play on the speaker. Um, what I want is those listeners used to that uh, level of convenience to also want a level of sound quality. And so how do we give them that? You know, the paradox is more people are listening to music more of the time than ever before. They're just not listening to it in a good way. So we want them to get into that. So for up and coming enthusiast, the future market will be more integration. It'll be more electronics put with the speakers, uh, more convenience. There's no reason why you shouldn't also be able to get good quality with that. So I think there is a future as long as you see what that future is and don't get stuck in the old ways. What's your, what's your message to somebody who is happy or they think they're happy with their TV speakers or their $100 soundbar? What's something that you would say to them considering there's a decline in brick and mortar stores where they can actually go out and listen to them? You know, a lot of it is online. A lot of these speaker companies are actually going direct. What would you, what would be your message to them to maybe persuade them to? You know, that is a sad fact that brick and mortar is declining for hi-fi because so many things that you purchase, they are, I'd argue nearly everything you purchase is an emotional decision. Uh, with hi-fi, it comes down to the emotion of listening to music. You can't experience that by purchasing online. You only experience it once you get it home. So uh, that's a problem. That's a problem for all of us in the industry. We're all selling um, through some online stores, through Amazon, um, because of the declining brick and mortar. And it's difficult. So you have to rely on other people's recommendations, or be prepared to buy it and send it back. And that in itself is a different business model for all us in the hi-fi industry now, because uh, normally you only bought it once you knew you wanted to buy it, but now you're buying it because you don't know if you do want it. And so somebody's got <laughs> to handle returns, right? <laughs> um, so I don't really know what that, answer is um, other than enough people recommending something but then who do you listen to for those recommendations I'm trying to figure this out also because people are more than willing to buy a 70 inch 4k TV the newest UHD you know, HDR TV but they don't want to buy anything you know sound wise to improve that and I, that's something I personally it's uh, because partly uh, the idea that they're just listening to their TV speakers. It's because they've never had to uh, had an opportunity to hear better and understand what that can add to the experience. They go to the movie theatres and you've got great sound. They've never had that at home, never thought you could approximate that at home, never listened. 
mostly to anyone who got that at home. You know, just if you go looking at if you go looking at homes, uh, buying a home, or you look at these programs on TV about home buying. Have you ever seen anyone who's got a hi-fi system in any of I these programs? I always look for it. I always look for it. Um, you look at House, the, the, the program yeah. with that doctor. At least he got a hi-fi system in his office. Uh, you look at Suits, he'd got a clip system, yeah. right? So I, I spot those kind of things. Um, so people haven't understood that the emotional impact of, let's say, a movie or just regular program on TV can be enhanced so much more if they upgrade the sound associated with the picture. I think what happens is when they go to the movie theater, my, my theory, is they attribute most of it to the big screen and not so much to the, to the sound. sound. And yet a movie without sound sounds terrible. And there was a very interesting experiment done many, many years ago. They got three different TVs of apparently different picture quality. And you could come in and watch something on each of the TVs and rank order which one you thought was best. What they'd actually done, all three TVs were identical, but they got a better sound system, <laughs> you know, one, two, three. Good, better, best sound system. So what basically happened was the rank ordering went with the better sound. That's the crazy. picture was actually identical. So they understood or they experienced emotionally more involvement and attributed to it must be a better picture because that's what they were told the differences were. And so uh, the sound in a movie is critical and uh, it's just people haven't understood that that can happen in the home. That's a demo that I do in my, my shop. I have a retail shop and people always ask, why do you have all these speakers? And what I'll do is I'll play a trailer on my, on, my, my, on my smartphone and I'll have it connected to those speakers. And I'll say, tell me how engaging this is. We're watching from a phone right now, right. but I have them playing through these big speakers. How does this feel? And they're just like, they, they understand at that moment, wow, the sound makes a huge difference. Yeah. So something fun. Um, what does Andrew Jones listen to at home? What is your system at home? Right now. Oh, the system. So speakers are the original TAD Model 1 speakers. Um, the very first design I did for TAD as part of Pioneer, uh, along with a VTL um, big tube stereo amplifier um, and a high-end Berkeley Audio DAC um, running Rune, Rune Labs to source all my music. I do have a turntable set up, I just don't use it that much these days. Um, so that's the home system. Do you find you're competing with yourself a lot of times? But you're competing with oh, your previous yeah. design? Certainly, you, you, we talked earlier about the competition. The competition generally is myself. I've done enough speakers through the years of all the different price points, you know, all the way up to $80,000. So I have in my mind what what sound I can get, and I'm going to try and get as close to that whatever I design, knowing that obviously I'm going to make compromises. Um, so yes, it's <laughs> so when I did the Adante speakers, it's I'd had in mind some speakers I'd done for Pioneer TAD a while ago. <laughs> so what is new in Elax lineup? The ones that are imminent, actually uh, gone to production right now, is the Argo Navis speaker. So you know, we talked about wireless and powered. So this is, um, let's say, the starting idea was do an improved version of Unify, but at the same time make it self-powered. So it's three-way active uh, with a um, active crossover but not a DSP, it's a analog active crossover. When you build everything in, like um, some of the power speakers you get, you've got the amplification is switching amplifiers, you've got the DSP built in there, you've got the, the DAX built in there. When you buy that, that's the best it's ever going to sound. You can't upgrade it because everything's all there. Plug in your source and that's it. So we decided to do halfway house between traditional hi-fi and all-in-one. So it's active for the benefits that gives. It's analog active crossovers, so that if you have 
an existing system with, let's say, a turntable, you're not digitizing the turntable inside the speaker um, or you know, digitizing the analog sound. And if you want to upgrade your preamplifier or your DAC or your turntable, you'll hear that improvement. So the speaker will continue to allow you to get better and better sound out of your system as you upgrade all the other components. So halfway house. And uh, the bookshelf is $2,000 a pair. The tower is $4,000 a pair. So you know, not, not your $100 wireless speaker, but it also has wireless capability. Beautiful. Yeah. Last question from Tao Tao Lulu <laughs> on Reddit as, as well. And the question is, when are you going to release the active version of the ELAC Unify UB5? <laughs> well, so originally we were looking at simply putting an amplifier inside a Unify. And when we looked at it, when we looked at the cost and the marketplace for that, we realized that's not where we want to go first. We want to test the waters with Argo Navis. So superficially, it looks like we did an active version of Unify, but it's not. It's a, a obviously it's four times the price. And that's because it's upgraded drivers and all the electronics and done as a very uh, good sounding electronics rather than budget electronics. We were worried that if we simply activate the Unify, because the Unify was often being used with systems that are much more expensive that, than you would normally partner with a $500 speaker. So the system is sounding really good. And that was a deliberate. Make the speaker so good that you can put in a lot more expense into the rest of the system and really get good sound. If you simply make a, a very affordable powered Unify, you put in lower quality electronics, you put in a DAC, you've limited mm -hmm just it's not gonna sound potentially as good as the system you would have been partnering with a Unify. So we thought, okay, let, let's just step back from that decision and go with something to prove to ourselves the potential of what we can do with an active speaker and see how the market reacts to that and then go back and address what do we do as really affordable powered speakers. This is affordable in the context of you look at other higher end active speakers, but it's not affordable if you think that um, $500 was a good price for Unify. It's, it's four times that. So it's not that market. Um, like I said, that was a deliberate decision right now. I would love to see some powered uh, debuts I would, I would recommend it to everyone. Yeah, well. All you speaker bar people out there. Never say never. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to do this. All right. I appreciate you. Andrew Jones.